Aaron and Jamie Ivy, this is such a privilege to have both of you here right now um, in just this conversation we're about to have. So thank you for giving us your time today. Heck yeah, thank us. you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. I just was telling you guys before we hit record that I've been reading your new book called Compliment, and it has just been incredible. Um, and I'm so excited to ask you guys so many questions about it. But before we dive in, can you both just tell us like your names and a little bit about your guys' family, where you live, and then maybe tell me something you're enjoying in life right now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm Jamie and married to Aaron, who's also here. We have four kids. Uh, we're in a little different stage of life than you are, Callie. Our oldest is 17 and our youngest is 13. So we've got 17, two 15-year-olds and a 13-year-old. Uh, three of our kids joined our family through adoption, which is how we have two 15-year-olds that aren't twins. And um, I am a podcast host and a speaker and an author. And um, yeah, just w what am I loving right now? I mean, not to sound weird, but we actually really love our teenagers. That's amazing. Most of the time, you know, like, yeah. listen, the other day we were texting our friends that are about 10 years older than us asking, you know, what's wrong with these crazy kids. But we really <laughs> enjoy this life stage. And so I think that's what I'm loving right now. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And just to interrupt that, like, I know it's weird, but it's good not to be normal because kind of like we're about to talk with marriage. It's like the normal is like, oh, the terrible teens or the terrible twos or mm. marriage is so hard. So I love that you say that because that gives me hope and encouragement of like, yeah. you can enjoy your kids in different seasons. So that's amazing. Yeah. For and sure. enjoy them on different days, Callie. There's four of them. And we tell them every day we have a new favorite kid. So, you, yep. you know, it depends on the Rotate day. Through. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it doesn't even last the whole day. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Morning. Not anymore. Yep. Uh, okay. Well, I'm Aaron and um, I belong to Jamie and I um, am a songwriter and a pastor at a church here in Austin, Texas called the Austin Stone. And um, I'm loving, loving being a, uh, a dad right now. I also love, you asked for one thing, but I got two. I am loving my golden doodle right now. That's Martha Aww, sitting there in, so in my office. Your That's listeners amazing. probably can't see. Um, but here's, Jamie and I say this all the time with like our kids, because kids are up and down. You know, the one person in my life that is always happy to see me every day, always happy to see me is Martha, the golden doodle. <laughs> She's the best. Okay, I need, no to, I, need to, I need to clarify, Callie. Her name is Martha, M-A-R-F-A. -A. Oh. I know, because everyone's like- I heard Martha. Name. Yeah. I know you did, because we always have to clarify. And Martha, if you have any listeners who are live in Texas or in the West Texas, it's a city in West Texas that Aaron Ivy loves to go to. And so that's our dog's name. That's yeah. amazing. That is so awesome. How long have you had that dog for? Oh, like two years? Three, three years? years, maybe, yeah. Yeah. She's okay, perfect. how many dogs do you guys have? We have two dogs. We have a golden doodle named Martha, and uh, we have a labradoodle named Landry. And Landry was named after our favorite character in Friday Night Lights. That's Landry. amazing. That is so <laughs> awesome. And I just have to say, like, both of your guys' setups are so cool. Like, people who are watching this on YouTube are going to see it, but, like, Aaron's got the music going on. Jamie's got, like, the pretty <laughs> natural tones. I love it. It's so Thank cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and also, I just want to congratulate you guys. You guys have had a lot going on in the Ivy household. Like, this new book, Jamie, you had UBU come out this past year, right? It was the beginning yes, of 2020. In October. Um, you guys launched your podcast together and then Jamie has the happy hour podcast and I'm sure there's so many other things that are going on in your household, but just following you guys on Instagram and the podcast, I'm like, feels like left and right. Like, and there's this thing and this thing and it's so cool. Oh, and Jamie, you just, uh, launched your show as well. I did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The week so, that we're chatting, I just launched it. So it's been a fun week. Oh my gosh. Huge congrats to you guys. That is Thank so you. exciting. And I'm sure uh, just with having kids a little bit older, it's easier to do those types of things in the season, right? <laughs> 100%. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we, <laughs> yes. we could not have done all of this stuff, um, you know, when our kids were, were babies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, so tell us your guys' Enneagram types, and I'd love to hear the story behind how in the world you figured out your type, because everyone kind of, you know, gets confused of like the test, did someone help them? So I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I'll go first. I'm an Enneagram 6. And um, I remember when I started hearing about the Enneagram, in fact, I don't know, Aaron, if you remember this, we had gone, <laughs> this is funny, to Marfa, <laughs> Aaron and I had gone to Marfa for a, for a long little getaway. We stayed in the cute little Airbnb 
And I had been hearing about the Enneagram. And so I did what everyone tells you not to do. And I went online and took a test, you know, like a free test, uh, which now having several friends who love and teach the Enneagram, I realized that's not the best way to figure out your number. Right. But I did it anyways. And Callie, it told me that I was a two. And then underneath that was a six. And then I don't remember what the next one was. And, and I read all about the Enneagram too. And I was just like, I, that's not me at all. Yeah. Like, no. I am not this person. And so I did a little more investigating and I wanted to be a three so badly and, yeah. Aaron's a three, and you're a three. And like in my brain, threes are like the best. They get everything done. They're highly achiever. They, they can just do everything. And I am a very big achiever. And so yeah. I wanted to be a three. I was like, please let me be a three. Oh. Um, but I'm not, I'm a six, but I did read that a lot of times women in the South and Christian women will sometimes test as a two. Yep. And I just know that's not me. So that was my journey with, um, with figuring that out. And, and since it told me it was a two and I knew I wasn't reading books, um, because of my job, I interview people a lot. And right. I remember when I sat down with Suzanne Stabile, who's like Enneagram grandmother and, and we love the yeah. Stabiles, you know, it's like, whenever I interview people, it turns into my very own counseling session. So I, right. I really quickly figured out that I was a six and I've owned it since then. That is so amazing. And it's interesting. A lot of moms will type as twos as well, because it's like, they're in that helper role. And so I think that is the most common mistype I get. Cause I coach people one-on-one -on -one and they come in and they're like, I'm a two. And you know, I'm never like, no, you're not. It's like, but let's, you know, like ask some questions and dig into this. And like 85% of the time they figure out they mistype. So mm. I also like, I wanted to be a type eight actually, because I thought they're so good at like conflict and I don't like conflict. Like I can deal with it if I have to, but I'm not one to confront someone. And so I would test as an eight because I wanted to be like an eight and I'm like, I'm not That's a type eight. <laughs> I'm a three. So, okay, Aaron, let's hear your type and your story, or I guess we already know your type, but. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a three for sure. Uh, and you know, they say that the best way to figure out what number you are is not necessarily to take a test, but just self-assessment by reading. Right. Uh, the strengths, the the problem areas, all that kind of stuff. So when I read the three, it was like, this is reading me. Like, mm -hmm. this is 100% who I am and the way mm -hmm. I think and the way I operate. And it's been helpful. Like, uh, it's just a helpful tool, you know, to know, yeah. okay, that's why I do that. That's why I think that way. That's why I see the world through that lens. Absolutely. Um, and what's funny is I, also when your friends start to figure out what number they are, something clicks too and it makes sense for you. And I realized about a month ago, I'd never realized this before, but my closest friends, other than Jamie, right? My closest dude friends in life are all Enneagram nines. Wow, that's fascinating. That my is six so fascinating. closest guy friends are all nines. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Aaron a question. Is Brad a nine? No, is Brad. Brad? An eight, an okay. Eight wing nine. So that's, that's your cool. only friend, like but literally. Only, that's right. That's right. Wow, but he Closest. still has the like wing have, going on. You have a lot of friends, but like the people that you spend the most time with. Yeah, yeah, that's Brad so for sure. That's so fascinating. Is close close you mean tell you something fascinating about that, Kelly, as well? Please do. Uh, the two women that I've worked closely with in my company, both threes, and I'm wow. married to a three. Okay. So this is fascinating. Are you gonna too. figure us out, Callie? Well, well, I'm also making a connection. Like this is interesting, Aaron. My assistant is a type nine, and she's like saver of my life because I'm like, yeah. let's do this project and this thing, and I like have so yeah. many things going my on. My assistant like, is a nine, also. <laughs> she's yeah. like, Callie, how about you chill? Three. And so I tell her all the things I want to do, and she just says, "Okay, I'll do it." That's amazing. She gets them all done. That is so cool. Okay, so your guys' relationship. This is fascinating because three and six are connected. How have you guys, like, how has the Enneagram, I guess, impacted your marriage and knowing your strengths and weaknesses and connecting together? Has it helped? Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, you want to go first, Aaron, or me? I mean, it's helped me understand Jamie a little bit more. It's helped me see, like, what kinds of things she really needs from me, because I'm not, I am such a forward thinker. I don't, like, live in the present moment, and I hate thinking about the past. Yep. Um, so I'm always dreaming about the future. But it's really important for Jamie as a six to have somebody in the present moment and be Absolutely. living it. That's where she feels trusted and safe. And so it's helped me go, my forward thinking is a good thing, but it can be a negative thing in how I interact with Jamie. If I'm just Absolutely. only plowing through, I, I could sit in my office and work until seven o'clock every night and not be tired and, and be filled yeah. up. 
but what's important for Jamie is that I unplug at a certain time and I'm just with her uh, as a loyalist, right? Like her right. really needing that. So it's helped a lot. It's helped in yeah. conflict. It's helped in showing her love, like communicating it right. Yeah, yeah. it makes me think in your book, um, when you guys were talking about serving and like how true service is really understanding like what the other person needs because it's so easy for our default to be like oh this is what i want so this is what i'm going to do to my spouse and then the other person is like what the heck are they doing like this is not right. helpful right right right, right. Oh, what have you what have you learned um, about me jamie as a, as well a, i was going to ask you callie a question real quick as yeah. an enneagram six am i like am i because i always forget i guess i could think about myself but am i like forward present past where am i thinking y more present okay yeah yep yeah. um yeah i mean i think of one of the ways that, that it's really helped our marriage I'll, you know um in how aaron talks to me a little bit is i remember one time when i told him that uh i mean let me back up here Enneagram six is one of the things that can be true about some of us is that we can think like worst case scenarios. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I will say this, Callie, as, uh, Aaron and I are both Christians. And because of that, I have grown so much in not staying in those worst case mm. scenarios. So not living in the fear, Yeah. but the things still come. I mean, like yeah. I always tell Aaron, if you knew what came through my head, all day long, you would be crazy. And so oftentimes, not that much anymore, but I would say things to him like, oh my gosh, I'm worried about this. And previous to Enneagram work, he would say, Jamie, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's stupid. Oh, yeah. Don't think about that. And that would really hurt my feelings because it wasn't right. dumb to me. It was like right. really real. And so one time, I think it was Suzanne who taught me this. One time I said to him, I said, hey, when I say these things, what I would love to hear is that must be real scary to think mm. about that. Or mm -hmm. that must really scare you. And he changed the way he said that. And I felt so seen and heard and loved in that moment. Because for me, because of the growth I've had just like spiritually and emotionally, I don't actually stay there. Like, yeah. like if I have, you know, imagined one of my kids getting cancer, I don't stay there all day. I just right. think about it and then I move on. And so, so good. I think that's something that's really, that's the biggest change I've seen that the Enneagram has helped us. Absolutely. And I love yeah. that like, with Aaron, you guys having that language to communicate of like, okay, it might be easy for Aaron to just move on from a thought like that, but for you to identify that emotion, that feeling, but to know, well, you guys even quoted this in your book, Lisa Turkers, like it just because it's an emotion doesn't mean it has to stay there. I can't remember the exact quote that yeah. it is, but mm -hmm. it's not the truth. And that's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I'll answer what I, what I've seen to help in Aaron is, um, I don't know if this is an Enneagram thing or an Aaron Ivy thing, but um, when Aaron gets something that he's thinking about, like he has, a, he can't do anything else besides that. Like he needs to either complete that or work on that or think through that. And that's been difficult for me because I'm like, Hey, I'm over here. Like, let's just, can you just do both at the same time? Mm -hmm. And so I've had to kind of learn sometimes to let him go do what he needs to do so mm -hmm. that he can get done with it. I don't know exactly. if that's an Instagram thing, but yeah. It, yeah, it can be a three thing because it's like that project or whatever the thing is. It's like, it's all consuming. And you know, it can be healthy, it can be unhealthy. Like if I'm thinking this yeah. one thing is going to make me successful, like my house being perfectly clean, and I'm not giving Kramer, my husband, attention because I'm like so obsessed about our house. It's like, okay, that could be unhealthy if I need to like let the dishes go for like 10 minutes. It's okay, yeah. Callie, and sit and yeah. be present with my husband. But sometimes like, yeah, there needs to be something completed so that you can check it off in your brain and move on. That is so me. And it drives Jamie crazy because I'm like, before I can chill out, the countertops have to be spotless. Yes. Like, I cannot hang out with you while there is like stacks of clutter on the countertop. So I will come home and the first, and Jamie used to get really frustrated with me, but I would come home and I would put stuff up, you know, close yeah. the cabinet, the kids leave the cabinets open all the time. And she felt really unloved by that. But then I think when she understood, actually when I finished that, then I can actually be totally focused on Yeah. Me. Other types can be like organized and clean, but something with twos, threes, and fours in the feeling triad is think of us like we're sponges of our environment. Like we're such feelers. And so like if my office feels chaotic or messy, it is really hard for me to record a podcast or to focus or even like to have a conversation with my husband where he, he doesn't see the mess. Kramer's a type five, by the way, my husband. So he's in the head triad like you, Jamie. 
And like, he cares about cleanliness and organization. Like he'll totally help me with it, but it doesn't drive him as crazy as it does me. It's so interesting. This is our story. Yes. It's our yeah. story. Okay. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Jamie, one of the stories in your guys' book, Compliment, that you were writing that I literally was laughing out loud was when you were talking about this year in 2020 or past year, um, how you created like this detailed schedule all day to like help your family with four kids. You guys are both working from home. You have four kids basically homeschooling and you're like, okay, I'm going to get this place organized in a system. Actually, I should just let you tell the story. Tell the story of what you did and how you felt in that moment because I was dying. <laughs> Well, I mean, I am, I mean, the funny thing too, is just yesterday, Callie, one of my kids was looking for a binder and, um, they found a binder in their room and they're like, mom, remember when you did this? It was from like three years ago. And I probably spent like three days making a binder for every kid with tabs. And it says like summer activities or when I'm bored or books to read. And I, and literally he's flipping through it and not one page was filled out. Like he did nothing but i've continued to do these things for my children for all these years and they don't do anything so all this to say (laughs) covid hit everyone's home we had the longest spring break ever nobody went back to school and so i was like we can't live like this just whatever and so i did what i do best and i made a schedule it was probably like an excel spreadsheet and had (laughs) columns and everyone had different times because Callie, at this time we only had and only how privileged are we we have four children and we had three computers that they could use right yeah like old macbooks that probably took you know 15 minutes to boot up but anyhow we had three computers and so i had the schedule of everyone had everything going and i put it on the fridge and literally everyone all the kids not aaron all the children looked at me and they're like this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. I'm not doing this. I hate this. I hate schedules, all the things. And they complained about it and like whatever. But in a couple of weeks, that schedule was like our lifeline. Like it was like how the things moved in the day. And so um, I I think I wrote that probably saying Aaron and I parent so differently. He's never created a schedule. Um, And the kids really made fun of me and were like, we're not doing this. But over time, I can see that that strength of mine, Mm -hmm. um, it actually kept them moving last semester, you know, and getting things done. Absolutely. If I was the only parent in the house, they would <laughs> never have any doctor's visits. They would have a broken arm for six months. Uh, they would not have, you know, their homework done, like for real. Jamie being on it like that is what keeps moving. It's amazing. I mean, and like, that's the cool thing is like, that's the beauty of two different types, two different individuals owning who you are and like growing yourself, but like Jamie, not shying away from her gifts and Aaron, not shying away from his, his gifts. Cause that's what makes your family unit, yeah. your unit. Yeah. And I love that you guys spoke to that, that it's like parenting looks different for everyone, even like in the Christian world. Cause I, oh my gosh, when I first got married, it's like, okay, when we choose to have kids, I guess I'm going to have to stay home full time, always cook. I hate cooking. Jamie, I know you do too. And I'm like, praise the Lord. Like yeah. someone's given me permission to hate cooking. Yes. And I've just like felt like I have to be in this box, but it's so freeing when you learn like, wait a second, God didn't mess up in the way that he wired me and made me. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing a disservice to my husband, to my family, to the people in the my work that I do, if I'm not owning who I am and living into that fully. So I love that you guys speak to that. I really wanted to bring up um, kind of like the whole heart behind this book compliment, because you guys, I think it was Aaron, his section, he said, um, when you guys were about to get married, you guys heard people say like, oh, it's all going to go downhill from here. That was like a phrase that you said. And I was a Starbucks store manager. I was 21 years old. Kramer and I got married at 20. And in that season, I was so excited about marriage. People would ask like what I was up to. And I would tell them I just got married. And I would get that same comment. It was like, oh my gosh, like as if like I just committed like the worst decision of my life. And they'd be like, I'm so sorry. And so when you guys were speaking to that, I resonated so much because it made me mad. It made Kramer mad. And I'm like, there has to be a different way in life with marriage. And when I looked at the marriages um, in the church or people who weren't believers in my life, I did struggle to see couples that I was like, dang, I want their marriage. Like they look like they have fun. They still talk, they still hang out, but it was just dull. It was like they were roommates. And so that has been like mine and Kramer's heart. Um, We've been married almost six years. And so just had our first baby. So we've just have this heart and this prayer and desire of like, how do we stay intentional in our relationship and don't settle again for what's normal culturally and letting our marriage die. And so that was kind of a lot of me talking. I want you guys to talk now, but speak to that of like, how have you guys done this? How many years have you guys been married? Uh, It'll be 20 this year. 
Congratulations. Like that is so cool. And it's just inspiring to hear your guys' perspective. So yeah, speak to like the heart Mm -hmm. behind this book and why you two chose to reject that message. Yeah. Well, there were two books that we said we would never, ever write one, a book on parenting and two, a book on marriage. And the reason (laughs) we said we would never write it is because I think you need to be an expert on something before you write a book about it. You know, we are not experts. We don't have a perfect marriage at all. But the more we found ourselves in conversations with couples like pre-marriage or in the middle of marriage, we found ourselves like being the, you know, the counselors. We found ourselves like just saying, well, here's, here's what you should think about. Here's what we've learned from it. And seeing so many marriages fall apart in the last Mm -hmm. 20 years, like really good friends that have been married for 10, 15 years and then call it quits. um, We're just like, man, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way of talking about marriage and modeling what marriage is. And even though I didn't have very many marriages that I saw early on that were vibrant and life-giving and thrilling, we have seen some. And mm. we just made it uh, a real like intentional part of Jamie and I's life to look at the couples that are ahead of us that we can model our marriage after. Because it's not only like it's possible to have a good marriage, but God wants you to have a good marriage. When he thought up marriage and it was his idea, not any of ours, he didn't intend for it to be something that would be bland and apathetic and a drain. You know, he meant it to be something where two individual people could come together and complement each other in a way where something better comes out. Like it's not one plus one equals two, but when God puts marriage together, it's one plus one equals one, one new Mm -hmm. thing that is beautiful and awesome and really hard but really good so we just decided to take the leap and um from the beginning we said let's be super honest let's not hold anything back and uh we both wrote the same 10 chapters so when you when you get the book it's a sleeve and in it are two books one compliment by aaron ivy and compliment by jamie ivy and it's the same 10 chapters we wrote on topics like love, cheer, sex, forgive, fight, lead, follow, parent, mission, those kind of things. And we just took our time and we wrote our own book without even reading each other's. We didn't collaborate. We didn't talk about it. We didn't like make sure our perspectives lined up. We wanted you to get the real raw version of how I do those things and how I failed in them and how Jamie does those things and when she has failed in those too. And then hopefully at the end, you can see and you can swap with your spouse so you read both and you can see, oh, it doesn't have to be perfect to be great. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be always mm-hmm. easy for it to be great. It just, ta- it just takes time and work and truly like complimenting the other person, bringing out the best in the mm-hmm. other person. That's so good. And it makes me think like, Jamie, when you were talking about being a type six and like having the anxiety, but as you've grown, it's not that you sit in that anymore, but you still experience it. And I feel like that's what it is with marriage is it's not this perfection. Like, Oh, we never fight or we're never frustrated. You never annoy me. It's like, no, that stuff happens all the time. But what do you do with it? How do you communicate about it? How do you work through it? How do you, do you let a bottle up or do you actually go and seek help? And that's, that's what I loved in your guys' stories throughout the entire book from both of you is like, okay, here's how I failed. But then here's what we did to ask for forgiveness or to seek help. Here's how we worked through it. And how, here's how we're continuing to work through it. It's my husband and I call it a can do mindset just in life. It's like, we can do this. We can figure this yeah. out. And you're always yeah. looking for ways to grow yourself versus being a victim and just staying stuck of like, well, my husband doesn't help me enough with the dishes. So I'm just irritated at him. It's like, nope, Mm -hmm. we can problem solve through this and continue to work through it. So I'd love for you guys to speak to, um, how have you like, how have you seen this impact your children as you guys have been so intentional in your marriage? Like, how do you think that has impacted your household as a whole? I mean, I would like to say that our kids are seeing a really um, healthy, vibrant marriage and two people that really love each other. Um, You know, no shade on my parents, but I don't think my parents ever went on a date ever. Like I don't, Mm. I I have zero memory of them ever leaving the house without us. Wow. Um, And our kids know that we're always leaving the house without them, whether that's for a date night or a weekend getaway or a 14 day trip to Italy, whatever that might be. Like, you know, we're going to take care of our marriage. And so- I believe that our kids are growing up seeing that we show affection to each other in front of them. Um, we don't have like knockdown drag outs in front of them, but we have argued in front of them and said, I'm sorry in front of them. And so 
I think one of Aaron and I's biggest goals in life as we're raising kids is not just to raise like a good 15 year old or 13 year old, but to, we're looking towards adulthood. Mm-hmm. Like we're, we're thinking through a mindset of how are these kids going to be, you know, when they're 20 and 30 and, and one of my, man, I just thought about this just now, but I think one of my biggest, like, just, I would be so happy if my kids, if God has in their plan for them to get married, if when they got married, that they could look at us in the eyes and say, oh my gosh, I almost started crying, is that they could look at us in the eyes and say, you set a really good example of what we see a marriage to be. And Mm -hmm. that's important for us, you know, Mm -hmm. because our four kids, if all four of them get married, are going to have families and then they're going to have kids. And I just see the ripple effects for generations from just us to saying, hey, we're going to be committed to each other through the good times and the hard times. And we're going to be intentional with our marriage because we have four people that are watching, you know, Absolutely. and those four people matter to me and Aaron more than whoever reads this book. You know, those right. people are the most important people that we could ever influence. Absolutely. Cause they're literally watching their mom and dad yeah. live it out every yeah. single day. That yeah. is so powerful, Jamie. And it's like, um, you guys also, also mentioned this in your book, but it's like, does my marriage make people want to follow Jesus more? Like that's mm-hmm. mine and Kramer's goal is like, it, and if they don't like something's wrong with the pit, like we're not actually loving each other. And then that brings up the whole topic that I'd love you guys to speak about is what is love? Because I feel as if that is very confusing in our culture. And I have clients that I work with that feel as if they're in love with someone because that person like compliments them or makes them feel a certain way. Um, but I'd love for you guys to break down according to you and what you believe and what the Bible says, what do you believe true love actually is and how can we grow in learning to love our spouses mm-hmm. or um, maybe you're dating someone? Yeah. Well, um, we both tackled this, um, that question in, in our book and, and have two different perspectives that definitely do like mesh up, they line up together. Um, but I think the the perspective that I come from is like, uh, love seems like this very mysterious, like ambiguous sort of thing. And unless like you are actually looking to the love of God, there's no way you can actually understand what love is, much less love somebody in the right way. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really interesting that the Bible doesn't say that God has love or that God um, just loves us. Like it's something he possesses and then gives away, but it is his very nature. Like he is love is what the yeah. scripture says. God is the essence of love. And so for me to love Jamie correctly means I have to love her with that kind of God love. I have to understand first that I'm loved by God. And that's crazy. The fact that God loves me and likes mm-hmm. me and wants to hang out with me is crazy. It's absurd. Um, but until I grasp that, I can't love Jamie the right way. And loving her the wrong way is like expecting something in return or expecting uh, everything to be perfect or to always like her, always enjoy mm-hmm. being around her. That's that's not like God love. God love is like unconditional. I'm for you. I'm going to fight for you. Every single day, I'm choosing to love you like I've been loved by God. I think that's game changer for couples that are thinking about marriage because it's beyond attraction. It's beyond sex. It's beyond it's beyond a ring. It's beyond yeah. a wedding ceremony. It's something otherworldly that you have to first receive before you can ever give to someone. Yeah. And you're saying too, like that type of love, like understanding you're loved by God and then you're able to love Jamie because of that. That's what the foundation is for your marriage then. Because I think when we see marriages, so like up and down, or even when my own marriage is up and down, it's based off of my emotions and expectations, which is not a stable thing to be based off of. It's like, yeah. it has to be based off of Jesus. And if I'm not right with God, gosh, it's a hot mess in this household when that yeah. happens. So totally. Totally. yeah, that foundation, that's so good. Jamie, share, share your perspective of it. Um, everything you said, I also think like love is this um, choice. A lot of times when we get married, we have this feeling of love and I still feel that feeling of love towards Aaron, obviously. Right. But like you said, there's some times when I have to actually choose to love him. Yep. And that can sound very scary to people who are newlyweds or getting married and say, what? I, I'm so in love with him. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. And that is true. But I have to continue to choose to, to do those things over and over again. I mean, we see in scripture all the time, like the way that Christ is commanding us to live. And, you know, that first Corinthians 13, which is, you know, the love chapter we hear it at, you know, weddings all the time but that was actually written to the corinthian church because of the way they were treating each other it wasn't a marriage chapter 
And so I often think sometimes, man, God's word even says, here is the things that love is, and here Mm -hmm. are the things that love is not. And so as humans who we're prone to sin and prone to want our own, you know, what we want for ourselves, we have to find myself going back to what actually is love. And what does that look like for me to love Aaron, you know, that is lacking jealousy, that is kindness, that is goodness, you know, that doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Those things are love. And, you know, those things get harder the longer you're with someone because you get yeah. like complacent. You can mm. tend to think, you know what, I'm going to love everyone, but this person is the last person I have time for because he's here, he's committed, he's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so then a lot of times people will look up and think, wow, I don't think I've given any kind of thought towards loving my husband, like mm. actual, the actions of loving him. Um, and I don't mean sexual at all, but the actions of loving him this week, because I've been pouring that out to everyone around me. And so I think it is, it's intentional. It is an action and it's something you choose over and over and over again. Mm. Yeah. That was so good. Like both of your perspectives. So good. How have you guys cultivated an environment in your marriage where you guys can talk about conflict. You can give each other feedback um, or just share like your hearts. Like Jamie, you mentioned when you told Aaron, like it hurts when you shoot down like my fear because this is a legitimate fear I have. Like, how have you guys cultivated that environment? Because I think a lot of my listeners would be like, that sounds awesome. But if I go tell my husband how I feel, he's just going to jump on that or vice versa. And they don't feel like it's a safe place. And I'd love for you guys to explain how you've gotten to that point. Well, we're still learning um, and we don't do this perfectly. I mean, literally last night we got into an argument where it started with one person, Jamie, saying, uh, this is how I felt when you did this. And I typically, you know, try to react with, I'm so sorry that you felt that way. I'm sorry, you know, that it did that to you. But I jumped immediately into defensive mode, like for real. So we're still learning this. And I think the key that we've figured out when we do it right is for there to be this like constant culture of I can tell you what what how I'm reacting to something without the fear of you diminishing that or blowing that off or taking it personally Mm -hmm. and I think that just takes a lot of time takes a lot of Mm -hmm. time and practice I would say nine out of ten times when Jamie and I do that it goes well right and we're yeah. trying to get to 10 out of 10, but it takes time. I mean, we're 20 years in and we're, we're still learning how to do that. I think what's also helpful is to have like, to go into whatever conflict uh, already with a posture of forgiveness. Um, like not even knowing what you're gonna have to forgive the other person mm-hmm. for, but starting with a posture of forgiveness uh, has been really helpful for, for me and for Jamie both. That is so good. Jamie, do you wanna uh, add anything to that? Yeah, I found that Lisa Turker's quote. And oh, Lisa good. says, okay. feelings are indicators, not dictators. They can indicate where your heart is in the moment, but that doesn't mean they have the right to dictate your behavior and boss you around. And it's from a book of hers called Unglued, Making Wise Choices. And I think that's something I was going to add counseling too. We both see a counselor and I cannot highly recommend that enough within your own personal lives and your marriage. But I think that's something that like we are growing on and like even that my counselor has been working with me on is just understanding like just because I have a feeling doesn't mean that it's true. So if I feel something that Aaron, I feel like he's doing this, that doesn't make it true. And so for Mm -hmm. me, it's my own personal battle of not believing my feelings to be true. Mm -hmm. They can't dictate what's actually happening in the situation. And so I think it's also, you know, 20 years being married and you know, we talk in the book and publicly 2020 was just a, 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 a rough year for the IVs, March, April, May, June. I'm like worst four months of our marriage ever. Uh, and I think a lot of people would have that same story just with everything that our country went through. Um, and I'm telling you on the other side of those four months, we are, we have grown so much just in Mm -hmm. our communication because we had circumstances that made it where we had to more than ever. Uh, and so there's been so much of like, I I think that's what I want to say is that I've learned a lot in the last year is like the last person I want to hurt actually is Aaron. Like Mm -hmm. I, that just hurts my heart to think that Aaron would be hurt because of me, because of something I said, or because of something I did. And so I value that, that I don't want to hurt him. And so sometimes when I hear that I've hurt him, sometimes I'm like, all, all, all of a sudden I'm defensive. But when I step back from the situation a little bit, I have to remember, gosh, I love this man so much. I would never want to hurt him. So it causes me to have ears that want to listen and a heart that wants to change and, a, and humility. Um, but like Aaron said, 
God, we, we're still working at this, you yeah. know, but right. It's the a journey until the like, day we die. It is a journey until the day we die. And I just think mm. we're better today than we were yesterday. We're better yeah. last year than we were the year before. And I mean, that's a big church word, sanctification every year, yep. you know, every day we're looking more like Jesus and that comes into your marriage as well. Yeah, absolutely. So this next question I want to ask you guys is like really selfish in the sense of it's for me and my husband. I'm like, I, I want to ask Jamie and Aaron this. So Kramer and I both have our own businesses and we help each other a lot in each other's businesses, but we're entrepreneurs. We work from home and it is such a blessing. And we really had that goal and vision that we wanted to set ourselves up for that. But as you're talking about being intentional, I know you guys have they're separate things, but they're not separate, right? Because you guys are a unit together that you are pouring and helping one another. How do you prioritize your marriage and like time to be intentional, but also stewarding like your children, the calling God has put on Jamie's life and Aaron's life. And how, how do you guys do that and stay intentional with your marriage? Because I think busyness can sometimes be the, the thief of intentionality. And that's what we don't want to have happen in our household. Yeah. yeah. We get this question a lot, like just from, from friends that will kind of see from the outside. Um, and it seems like you guys are doing everything and you're doing it all the time. How in the world are you doing all of that stuff, you know? And one is we have a team of people around, both of us that help. Yeah. But two is we don't do everything all the time. We have seasons, uh, like intentional seasons where we're working on this or we're doing this. Um, you know, so we're not always writing books. We have a book writing season or a songwriting season. Same thing with like daily stuff. Um, Jamie and I uh, have made a commitment from day one that we were going to date each other. And so every Monday night, that's our standing date night on our calendar. And people know that, our kids know that. There are nights where um, no one's invited to our house. It's family night and it's just for our kids. And like having moments where you're like focused in on what are the priorities and where do they fit on the calendar? Mm. Um, what are the, you should be able to pull up my iCal and see, this is what Aaron values. This is what's most important to him yep. because I see it listed on the schedule. And what's been helpful for Jamie and I is to make marriage something that is like intentionally we're putting time and effort into. If not, then busyness for sure will take over. Yeah. And then we'll go six months and be like, wow, we should probably go on a date night, you know? Um, right. So it takes, it takes like thought and planning. Yeah. That's, and I so say good. that it takes money as well. And I, and I want to, to, to expand on this real quick is we've been married for 20 years and there were seasons when we didn't have the extra money for date nights. And so what that meant for us with young kids is putting them down to bed. Cause when they're little, they go to bed like seven. It's awesome. Putting them <laughs> down for bed and then being intentional with that time. Like we're not just going to veg out on our computers, which a lot of, you know, people who, you know, work from home can do. We're not going to veg out on our computers. We're not going to, you know, go to different rooms and watch different TV shows, but that intentionality. So that was like dating for us then. Mm. You know, I remember one of my most favorite memories is that when all of our kids were in preschool, uh, every Tuesday, Callie, Aaron and I would meet at the exact same restaurant. And there was no babysitting fee because they were already in school. So that was, I mean, kind of a fee, but you know what I mean? And we right. would eat at the exact same restaurant. And the funny, do you remember this, Aaron? We had a to-go menu and I kept yeah. it in my purse and our goal was to go through the entire menu. And That's that amazing. was what we did every <laughs> Tuesday. Um, but I think so. And when I say it takes money, someone can think, oh, I don't have money to, you know, go mm -hmm. for a weekend trip to, you know, wine country or whatever. But for us, when we did our budget, we had a line item for babysitters yeah. because we just knew that we have to value and where you put your money is, is what you value. And we yep. had to value babysitters because we had to have those nights away. For me, when I was a stay at home mom, it was, oh, it was, don't tell me we're going to miss a date night because I am. <laughs> you lived for dressed. it. <laughs> I'm going to shave yeah. my legs and I might even blow dry my hair because <laughs> My man is taking me out. And even now, now that, you know, all of our kids are in school clearly and, and we have, you know, different kind of jobs, but still even now, like we yearn for that, for those moments when it can just be us uh, out together. And so I think it's important to, to, to put it on the calendar. Like you mm. have to put it on the calendar and you have to set the money aside. I love that. And I love that you're bringing up like the money part. Cause it is true. And I do think that's an actual block for people. And 
that's something Kramer and I, for multiple years, we've said we want to take quarterly retreats together. And we were so bad at implementing it. Like we just straight up didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And the past, this past year in 2020, we were like, are we going to do something about this? Or are we just going to keep saying we're going to do it? And we finally have been putting it on the calendar and it's been so good for us. And just to look forward to something like that too. It's like knowing I have that time blocked out with him where it's like, I'm not focused on work. He's not focused on work. And we're able to just go have fun and talk. It's, it's been so life-giving and we're only half a year in. So I just can't wait to see what 20 years of that will do for us. Yes. Yeah. Jamie's right. It does take money, but it doesn't take a lot of money. There were, there were times where just a Starbucks date, you know, and that's about $7 and everyone can find $7. Yes. Or go Um, to Sonic and sit in your car. Like (laughs) something happy hour. You can get a large drink for 99 cents. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, just like you make sacrifice uh, in time and your budget for the things you really love, um, you, you'll find the money, you know, to do it. And so it doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be a week in Italy, um, but just a consistent time where it's like, this is just for us. And for those that are listening that have really difficult marriages right now, like it's not fun. It's not mm-hmm. thriving. It might take a while to get there. You know, it might be yeah. the first couple of months of meeting together weekly it might be hard conversations. It might be a little bit miserable, but it might have to, you know, you might have to sit in that for a little bit before you start to trust each other. And then the fun kind of sets in and like, oh, wow, this is what it was like when we were dating. I remember that. That was fun. Yeah. Good start. Yeah. That's and so good. Another thing about dating that I think is so important that we forget is everyone wants to be chosen and everyone wants to be seen. And you can get in a really big rut, you know, 10, 15, 20 years in with, if you can, especially if you're adding children to your family or a career, that it is even that moment when I'm looking at Aaron and saying, I choose just you for tonight. I don't Mm -hmm. choose any of the kids. I don't choose any work. I know I have a deadline, but I choose you. And for me, as someone who just craves quality time, when Aaron says, I just choose you, like there's no computer, there's no phone, I'm taking you to a restaurant, we're going out. Um, that is just so, I feel so loved in that moment. And mm-hmm. so even when Aaron's talking about if you're having you know, a hard marriage, sometimes one of you just wants to feel chosen and feel seen. Mm-hmm. And so even just that like, hey, let's go out tonight. If that's a new thing, that could just spark so much conversation and so much more than you ever thought you needed because you haven't been putting the time towards it. So good. I think it's interesting how like, or at least this happens for Kramer and I, it's like changing our environment sparks so many conversations that like don't always just happen in home. Like you put us in the car on a road trip and it's like the best thing ever. So whenever I'm like, I want to talk to him, I'm like, Hey, let's just go drive (laughs) because I want to get you locked in this car. But I think that's so good, Jamie, just like how can you look at your spouse and try to make them feel seen and loved and doing it in a way that they're looking for and needing and craving. So with your guys's book, um, it releases March 2nd. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. So it's available for pre-order. Can you guys tell us who you specifically wrote this for? Like, is it just for married people? Is it for people dating? Like who do you hope will read this? We, we wrote it with a couple different audiences in mind. Um, one is we wrote it for people that are currently married that, um, They just want to take a step forward in the health of their marriage. It doesn't have to be broken, right? But maybe it is. But uh, married married people who are just like, let's be intentional about our marriage and let's 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 take a let's take a step forward in it. That's one audience. The second audience is um, people that are thinking about marriage, right? You're dating or you're gonna be dating soon. You want to know like, is marriage is it possible for it to be great? Is it possible Mm -hmm. for Uh, a future marriage uh, that God might have for me to be wonderful. Um, We wrote it for that audience too. Awesome. I, yeah, I'm like, everyone needs to buy this because (laughs) reading it, I feel so impacted. Like I would say my marriage is in a very healthy place, but there is so much growth for Kramer and I, and Mm -hmm. we want to keep growing. We're in a new season of parenting that it's like, what the heck are we doing? And, but it's just such a breath of fresh air because you guys are like mentors to us. And I'm so thankful for the internet. I'm thankful for books and the way that we can learn from people from all over the world. It's truly incredible. Mm -hmm. And to hear your guys' heart for the Lord and your love for each other and for your family and just for other people, like you want to see the kingdom of God be present in marriages 
it, that's just what was so encouraging to me and inspiring because it was giving Kramer and I tangible things of like, okay, these are areas we can work on and improve and grow. Mm -hmm. And we're not the only ones struggling with this or confused about this thing. It's like, okay, Jamie and Aaron have been through this too. Like, this is yeah. awesome. So yeah. I would encourage all of my listeners to go grab this book because it truly is going to help you thrive in your relationships. Um, yes, romantically, but I think even in friendships too, like there's incredible concepts in it. So yeah. Jamie and Aaron, seriously, thank you so much for being on my podcast and sharing your guys's wisdom and insight. I am so thankful for just your guys's time. Thank Allie, you. This was so great. Nice thank to, you. Yeah, it was so nice to be on here and thank you for all those kind words. For yeah. real. That means a lot to Jamie and I thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, congratulations to you guys and best of luck on, best of luck on your book. Thanks. Thank